Hi everyone, Stephen Daniela here, Holistic Health Coach and Founder at TV Fork. Today I'm going to be taking you through some anatomy of the axial skeleton. Before I get started with the lecture, I would just like to take this time to remind you that if you are interested in obtaining a copy of this board that you see in my right, I will be uploading a picture of it onto our Instagram account as well as our Facebook page, so be on the lookout for that. I'll also be including a link in the description box to our Facebook account as well as our Instagram account. So let's get started. All of the images that I'm going to be showing today come from Miriam's Human Anatomy and Physiology, so if you are interested in brushing up on your anatomy, pick up a copy of it. Just a quick recap from last week's lecture, there are 206 bones in the human body and they can be subdivided into two categories, the axial skeleton and the appendicular skeleton. The axial skeleton being our skull, our rib cage, and our vertebral column. In total, there are 22 bones that make up the skull. We have our cranial bones. Our cranial bones are going to function to enclose and protect the brain. If you're having trouble remembering what the cranial bones are, I've come up with a mnemonic for you to remember. That is, oh fuck, please stop talking Ellen. Now, before you start getting pissed off at me, I am not referencing Ellen DeGeneres, it's just I couldn't think of another name that starts with the letter E. In total, we have eight cranial bones. They are our occipital bone, which is the posterior side of our head. We have our frontal bone, which is the anterior side of our head. We have the parietal bones, one right, one left, which form the lateral aspects of our head. We have our temporal bones, again, two, one on our right, one on our left. They also form the lateral aspects of our head. The parietal bones are superior. Inferior to our parietal bones are going to be our temporal bones. Our sphenoid bone is a bad shaped bone that spans the width of our cranial fossa. And finally, we have our ethmoid bone. It is a complex shape between the sphenoid and nasal bones. It is also very deep. One thing to note with the cranial bones is that we do have four major sutures that articulate the skull bones together. A mnemonic that I have come up with to help you remember the four main sutures, stop Sally from coloring on Larry. So stop, that's going to be our S. That is our squamous suture. Our squamous suture, we have two, one on our right, one on our left. And it is the articulation between the parietal bone and the temporal bone. Next, we have our sagittal suture. Our sagittal suture goes right down the midline and it articulates our parietal bones to each other. Third, we have our frontal or coronal suture. These sutures articulate the frontal bone with the parietal bones. And lastly, we have our lambdoid or lambdoidal suture. The lambdoidal suture articulates the parietal bones with the occipital bone. Now that we've discussed the cranial bones, let's take a look at the facial bones. The facial bones are generally more elongated in men. In women, they tend to be more round. And we have 14 total facial bones. The mnemonic that I have come up with to help you remember the facial bones are Mad Max never lets Zorro play with Venom's inferior nasal concave. First, we have our mandible. Our mandible is a U-shaped lower jaw bone. It is the largest and strongest bone of the face. Next, we're going to take a look at our maxillary bones. We have two maxillary bones, one on the right, one on the left, and they are fused medially to form our upper jaw, and they anchor our upper teeth. Our mandible anchors our lower teeth. Third, we have our nasal bones. Again, one on the right, one on the left. These are thin and rectangular. They are fused medially to form the bridge of the nose. Next, we have our lacrimal bones. Again, we have two, one on the right, one on the left. They are delicate and fingernail shaped. They also articulate with the frontal, ethmoid, and maxillary bones. Our zygomatic bones form our cheekbones. We have two, one on the right and one on the left. They are irregularly shaped and they articulate with the temporal, frontal, and maxillary bones. Next, our palatine bones are two L-shaped plates and they form the posterior part of the heart palate and a small part of the nasal cavity and orbital walls. Our vomer, we just have one vomer. It is slender and plow shaped and it forms the inferior part of the nasal septum. And lastly, we have our inferior nasal concave. We have two inferior nasal concave. They are thin curved bones in the nasal cavity and they form part of the lateral walls of the nasal cavity. Now that we've taken a look at the bones of the skull, let's take a look at the hyoid bone. The hyoid bone, it doesn't quite fit into the bones of the skull. We only have one hyoid bone. It lies just inferior to the mandible and anterior neck, and it looks like a miniature version of the mandible. Also of note, the hyoid bone is the only bone in the body that does not articulate directly with any other bone. Now that we've discussed the hyoid bone, we can now move on to the next section of our axial skeleton, which is going to be our vertebral column. 
In total, we have 33 bones that make up our vertebral column. We have 24 vertebrae, and then we have our sacrum and coccyx. Our sacrum is made up of five fused bones, and our coccyx is comprised of four fused bones, although some people will have three, others will have five. Our vertebral column can further be subdivided into five separate sections. We have our cervical column. Our cervical vertebrae, we have seven in total, and they form a lordotic curve. They are identified as C1 to C7, the highest being C1, and then increasing as you move inferiorly down the cervical column. They are the smallest and lightest of all the vertebrae. Our C1 is our atlas. It is the highest of the cervical vertebrae. It doesn't have a body and it has no spinous processes. Instead, it has a lateral mass. When you're thinking of atlas, think of Greek mythology. Atlas had to carry the weight of the world on his shoulders, and our C1, we have to carry the weight of our head, which is our world. Below the atlas, if we were to go down one vertebrae, we have our axis. Our axis has a body and transverse processes. They also have knob-like dens that act as a pivot point for the atlas, and that dens would have been the body of the C1. Next, we have our cervical vertebrae of C3 to C6. C3 to C6 have an oval body, and they are wider from side to side than they are from front to back. They have short spinous processes that project directly back and are bifid. What that means is that they split at the tip. They also have large triangular vertebral foramen, where arteries pass. The last of our cervical vertebrae is our C7. Our C7 are essentially the same as our C3 to C6. The only exception is that instead of having a small spinous process, they have a very large prominent spinous process. Now that we've taken a look at our cervical vertebrae, let's take a look at our thoracic vertebrae. We have 12 total thoracic vertebrae. They begin quite small and get larger the more inferior you travel. They also have a kyphotic curve. Our thoracic vertebrae are identified as T1 to T12, and all will articulate with the ribs. The body has roughly a heart shape and the vertebral foramen is circular shaped. They also have spinous processes that are long and point sharply downward. Our T1 to T10 also have transverse coastal facets. Next, let's take a look at our lumbar vertebrae. We have five total lumbar vertebrae. Just like the cervical column, they also have a lordotic curve. They are identified as L1 superiorly and then inferiorly going down to L5 and they are very massive and kidney shaped. The reason they are so big is because they are more inferior, they have a lot more weight to support, therefore they need to be a lot larger to support the weight of our entire torso. They have shorter and thicker pedicles and laminae than the other vertebrae, their spinous processes are short, flat, and hatchet shaped, and their vertebral foramen are triangular. Also the orientation of the facets lock the vertebrae limiting rotation. Now that we've taken a look at our vertebral column, let's move to our sacrum and coccyx. Our sacrum is comprised of five fused bones. It is the posterior wall of the pelvis. They are identified as S1 to S5. They are triangular shaped and they articulate superiorly with L5. Inferiorly, they articulate with the coccyx and laterally, they articulate with two hip bones to form the sacroiliac joints. Next, we are going to take a look at the coccyx. The coccyx is four fused bones, however, some people do have three, some people do have five. They are small and triangular, and they are commonly known as your tailbone. Some characteristics of the coccyx, they articulate superiorly with the sacrum, and they afford slight support to the pelvic organs. Otherwise, our coccyx is essentially useless. It's basically just a leftover projection from thousands of years ago when we used to have tails. Now that we've discussed the vertebral column, let's take a look at the thoracic cage. The thoracic cage has 27 total bones. They are further subdivided into the sternum and the ribs. The sternum can be subdivided into three categories. The sternum, of course, being the breastbone. We have the manubrium. The manubrium is the top part. Then we have the body of the sternum, which makes up the bulk of the sternum. And finally, we have the xiphoid process, which is a tiny projection at the bottom of the sternum. The manubrium is shaped like a knot in a necktie, and it articulates laterally with the clavicles via the clavicular notches and the first two pairs of ribs. The body of the sternum is the mid portion and forms the bulk of the sternum. It articulates with ribs two to seven. And finally, we have our xiphoid process. The xiphoid process is the inferior end of the sternum. It is made up of hyaline cartilage in the youth, although as we get older, it ossifies in adults over the age of 40. It articulates with the sternal body. Lastly, we have our ribs. 
our ribs, we have 12 pairs of ribs. So 12 on each side, making 24 total ribs. All of our ribs are going to attach to our thoracic vertebrae and they curve inferiorly towards our sternum. Not all of our ribs look exactly the same. They do have some distinguishing characteristics. Ribs one through seven are considered our true ribs. They are also known as our vertebrosternal ribs. The reason they are called our true ribs is because they attach directly to our sternum. Ribs eight through 12, these are our false ribs. They attach indirectly to the sternum or entirely lack a sternal attachment. Our false ribs can then be further subdivided into two classifications. We have our vertebrochondral ribs, which are ribs 8 through 10. These attach to the sternum via the coastal cartilages. And finally, we have ribs 11 and 12, which are our floating ribs, also known as our vertebral ribs. The reason they are called our floating ribs is because they have no anterior attachments. This concludes our lecture today on the axial skeleton. Again, I would like to remind you that if you would like a copy of this board, I will be uploading a picture of it onto our Instagram account as well as our Facebook page. And if you liked the video that you saw today, please like, share, and subscribe to our channel. Again, all of the images that were shown throughout the video come from Marriott's Human Anatomy and Physiology. So if you would like to purchase a copy of the book, I will also be adding a link in the description box where you can purchase the book. Next week, I will be discussing the appendicular skeleton, so be on the lookout for that. Thanks, and I'll see you again next week.